Welcome back to Free Media. I'm Robbie Suave. And I'm Amber Duke. Was President Joe Biden's abysmal debate performance a one-off? Not according to veteran reporter Carl Bernstein, who told CNN's Anderson Cooper he'd spoken with multiple sources close to Biden, and here's what they had to say. The Joe Biden we saw uh, is not an, a one-off, that there have been 15, 20 occasions in the last year and a half when the president has appeared somewhat as he did in that horror show. Uh, that we witness. And what's so significant is the people that this is coming from, and also how many people around the president are aware of such incidents, including some reporters, incidentally. Former Obama Homeland Security Secretary Jay Johnson said that even a compromised Biden is better than the alternative. Let's watch. A presidency is more than just one man, one woman. It's an administration. I would take Joe Biden on his worst day at mm -hmm. age 86. So long as he has people around him like, like Avril Haines, uh, Samantha Power, Gina Raimondo supporting him over Donald Trump any day with the crowd that was behind him on January 6, 2021. So let's address the Carl Bernstein news first. Um, I actually thought that was a pretty big revelation that um, this is not something, the debate performance, that was a one-off. This is something that those close to Biden have seen from him 15 or 20 times in recent months. Um, that helps explain why Biden's advisors have been at great pains to keep him from the media, to prevent him from doing confrontational interviews, um, fewer and fewer press conferences over time. We've seen him at a few press conferences where he gets totally disoriented and confused about what country, what world leader he's even talking about. I, they bet it all on this debate performance, and boy, has this gamble not paid off. But uh, I, I don't see how anyone could be profoundly could be anything other than profoundly concerned about the president right now, not even for four more years, right now. Exactly. I'm not surprised by the revelations. I thought it was obvious watching the debate performance and some of the other moments we've seen over the past couple of months that people in the White House knew. And all of this shock and awe from both the media and the Democrats following the debate was play pretend. But I am surprised that the White House sources would talk to Carl Bernstein about it and have this report come out. Yeah. Because typically the White House in terms of spin and messaging is very buttoned up in terms of protecting their people, um, particularly the president. And we've also seen reporting from Alex Thompson over at Axios that the White House staffers acknowledge that Biden is a 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. president. They don't ho hold public events outside of that window for a reason. And that uh, Jill Biden is one of the people most responsible for shielding the president from any staff that are not very senior and very close within the president's circle to avoid this reality getting out. I mean, the best defense of their actions, if I was to try to construct one, would be something like this. It's got the the downturn has been very has been sudden and recent. Obviously, he's been an elderly man for a long time, and his uh, his performance, his ability to communicate, has you know decreased with every you know time he's he's been exposed to a campaign. If you watch you know old videos of him debating uh, what Paul Ryan from what was that 2012, um, he's just way sharper, has a much better way with words than he did subsequently to when he was running for president the first time and now. But, you know, some of that decline is natural. But ha has he turned a corner in, in recent months that maybe even wouldn't have been evident two years ago, let's say? I think that might be what's happening. And, and you know, we, we know this, I, I think everyone knows this from dealing with elderly family members that you know, the a decline can be sudden and it can be, you know, well, you're still having more good days than bad days. You have an occasional off day. And then all of a sudden you're having a lot of off days. And, no, you know, people, that's going to happen to everybody. It, it's sad, but it's a part of life. But the idea that we would continue to have someone going through that be, have the most important most powerful job in the world. And, and this isn't just about Joe Biden. We, we have this across <laughs> our entire elected government. We have the oldest Congress ever. We have Dianne Feinstein dying in office. Um, Mitch McConnell uh, had a lot of, was, was evincing cognitive issues and had no business continuing as leader of, of the Republican Party within Congress and has decided not to continue in that role. That is absolutely necessary, I think. 
And so too of Joe, but how, how can you look at Joe Biden differently? I think it's telling that the White House in response to this did not allow the same reaction that they did after the Robert Herr report came out, which was they sent Biden out for this angry press conference the evening after the report dropped, referring to him as the well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory. And Biden lied his way through the press conference, accused Robert Herr of bringing up his dead son for no reason. It was Biden who brought up his dead son and then forgot. That's according to NBC, by the way. That is according to mainstream reporting, correcting Biden on that point. Yeah, and it was in the transcript. Yeah. Um, and Biden forgetting within several years when his son actually died, as well as other uh, issues throughout the interview with Robert Herr. Um, and then in the press conference, uh, I believe that was when he mixed up the world leaders, when yeah. he was asked a question at the end of the press conference about the Israel-Hamas war. Um, they're not doing that this time around. He's not being sent out for an unscripted press conference. He had a short four or five minute event where he solely read off of a teleprompter, didn't take any questions. And so they've decided that apparently the potential benefit of keeping him shielded or the potential downside of allowing him to do an unscripted event um, is, is the better alternative to trying to actually do something that would demonstrate that he's capable of doing the job right now. Robert Herr has to be the most like swiftly vindicated person <laughs> of all time. Um, he, the, what he described Biden as a well-meaning elderly man, the for forgetfulness that came through in the interview, thus he lacked the kind of criminal modus, the uh, modus operandi to, to to have knowingly, you know, is the is the document retention thing that every major political figure has has uh, has uh, committed, and and seems to me to reflect a kind of knee jerk. Um, uh, not disclosing of public documents. We don't have nearly enough transparency. Everything is marked as classified even when it shouldn't be. So I, I thought that was a trivial matter and it was perfectly fine not to bring charges against him for it. But his rationale now looks prescient because what we saw from Biden was that and then some. Remember the howling of the pro-Biden people in the media that he dared say that about Joe Biden? Now it is just it, like it's obvious to, to everyone and, um, and Biden is, is taking a major hit in the polls, as we're seeing now from that debate performance. I think he was already shaping up to be an underdog before the debate. Um, there's gonna be another one in several weeks. But again, if, if the decline is setting in, I don't think there's any reason to expect him to be more at the top of his game um, next time around. Maybe they'll, maybe they'll hold it at 3 p.m. for him? I don't, I don't think so. I don't think no, that's going to happen. I don't think Trump would agree to that, nor should he. Yeah. Um, Much as you and I would like to not have a late night every now and then. Yeah, that would <laughs> be nice. In the news but commentary yeah, but we don't, uh, that, sector. Yeah, that doesn't always work out that way. Um, I mean, Jay Johnson, in his commentary about how the administration is really about the cabinet officials and not about the president, is obviously very concerning. Um, this is the party that is supposedly trying to save democracy by taking out Donald Trump and prosecuting him six ways to Sunday. Um, but yet they are totally reliant on both unelected bureaucrats in the administrative state and then these appointed cabinet officials to carry out policy uh, while there's apparently a complete figurehead actually in the role of the executive, which is the person who's supposed to have all of this power. Yeah, those comments were so telling. And it, it works both ways because, okay, if what you're saying is the person who is literally the president doesn't matter, it's just whether it's Democrats or Republicans in charge because then you're getting the, the behind the scenes bureaucrat type people, the experts, if it's Democrats who are always running things, it doesn't really matter who the presidential figure is. It's like, okay, okay then why does it need to be Biden? <laughs> like, That's then why point. do you need to run with the person who is clearly flawed at being able to communicate uh, a campaign message. If that's the, really what the job of the presidency can be reduced to is being a communicator on behalf of a set of policy plans and not actually the person who's making the decisions, the spokesperson rather than the actual ruler, then it doesn't need to be Biden. It should be someone who's a more effective communicator. And this argument is exactly what people like myself and you as well, the concerns that we have uh, that were addressed in the recent Supreme Court uh, decision um, overturning uh, Chevron, which we're very excited about here yes. in Reason Magazine, uh, the, the standard that allowed administrative agencies to make their own law, to have wide deference, to decide what policy should be without further review from Congress, without Congress specifically saying, well, this is what the law should be. 
Um, you know, Congress has really failed its job in, in recent years and has basically delegated all the actual legislating and rulemaking authority to these unelected federal bureaucrats, to the executive branch somewhat, now with a more, and then with Supreme Court occasional review. Um, they're not doing anything, which is not at all what our founders intended. But our founders certainly did not intend for unelected bureaucrats to set all these policies and face no democratic accountability whatsoever. So I was very excited to see that, uh, to see that decision made. Made. But uh, yeah, they're, they're kind of acknowledging that. Like, don't worry, it doesn't matter about Biden. They're trying to reassure their people, the Democrats are. Right. Don't, it doesn't matter because the same, you know, kind of uh, um, Fauci type people who brought you all your favorite mandates, they're still <laughs> behind the scenes in charge. I'm like, well, that's, that's a very comforting thought. Thank yeah, you for that. Yeah, don't worry about it. 90% of the government is still on autopilot. Yeah. And to your point about Chevron, um, obviously it was completely unjust for those unelected bureaucrats to be the ones interpreting vague laws when, you know, the Democrats refer to them as the expert class or the left refers to them as the expert class. In the Fisherman case that was brought before the court, Loper Bright, they had basically had a bunch of 22-year-olds who took like a day long training course, getting paid <laughs> by the fisher people to sit on their boat and tell them when they were overfishing. People who had been doing this for generations and generations in their family. It was obviously absurd. And if there is a squabble over the interpretation of the law, the people who are experts in interpreting law are judges. Right. Uh, and, and so they shouldn't be deferring to the bureaucrats interpretation of, of what that law is. They should Congress should do its job in writing less vague laws, and then the judicial branch should be doing its job in interpreting the law on behalf of people who are confused about it. Well, it's it. just the idea that, uh, as this came up, actually, in an argument we were having today on uh, Rising with the co-host I had today, Max Burns, and I was trying to say that, like, um, the, the bureaucrats also have an agenda. If, if you want to say, what, 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 we, you know, we need some kind of regulatory system to manage whatever the issue is, it was fishing in this case, all, all right, fine. But the people, the, the bureaucrats themselves, the regulators, they also have an agenda. They're also political operators. They're just ones that are not facing any kind of democratic accountability. So they can't just, like, they could totally abuse their power with respect to the people they're overseeing if, if, they're, if they're not told specifically. What, and, and, you know, the idea with our system is that we elect members to Congress and then they make these laws. And if we think those laws are bad, we can vote them out. But if, if the lawmaking, ends up being really substantially in the hands of the agencies and the bureaucrats and the administrators who don't face those pressures near, to nearly at all the same extent as the actual elected members of Congress, they can do whatever they want. And it's just very weird for like the pro-democracy crowd to be trying to defend that, that system, which has led to a lot of um, injustice over the years. It also doesn't prohibit uh, federal bureaucrats from making rules and regulations, but they just have to do it consistent with the laws that Congress pass. And if they right. overset their authority, then they no longer get the uh, sort of uh, deferent, the deference yeah. Yeah. From, from the courts. Yeah. More free media in just a minute.